Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the fourth lecture in the series of seven on how to get published uh, with the IEEE. What you learn today will be also um, generalizable to other publisher, publishers and publishing houses, including Elsevier, Springer, Sage, Routledge, and so many more. The topic of today's lecture is on drafting your thesis and your abstract. And in this instance, I'm not really referring to thesis as in your corpus, your thesis, your manuscript of your whole thesis, but something much smaller and perhaps even more important that lets your thesis proper hang together. So I'm not talking about drafting the 300 pages or the 200 pages that you will write uh, to submit to be formally um, uh, examined uh, in, and to get your PhD. I'm referring more to your underlying argument. And abstracts uh, in their own uh, way are very particular. Uh, most reviewers, most examiners will make a judgment based on the quality of your abstract. And your abstract is what sets you up, uh, whether it's a long work, a long manuscript, or a short two-page uh, submission. As we said last week, not all publications require abstracts, but it may well be worth writing one, even if they don't require one. Uh, you don't submit it formally. Uh, for example, if it's an IEEE magazine, check with the magazine um, submission process, but to my knowledge, most magazines uh, don't require an abstract. But for your own sake, an abstract helps you to ground your study and what you are trying to communicate. It's that short 250 words that summarizes everything about the paper you've submitted. And a lot of people write a good paper, uh, but forget to write a good abstract and that gets them into trouble. Um, or they write an abstract where they've promised so much and not delivered. Uh, and over time with maturity, over writing a number of abstracts, over revising your work, uh, being more clinical, you'll get better at writing abstracts. Abstracts, I think, are an art form and you get better at them the more of them that you write. So just to go over uh, and summarize uh, what our classes uh, have looked at so far. In the first week, we looked at working with your supervisor and your peers and the co-authorship policy in particular at UOW where you are studying. We looked at finding a publication outlet to target and where to begin and I exposed you to a number of platforms including uh, the IEEE recommender system, the Elsevier journal finder, the internal UOW databases that we have licenses to, for example, Scopus and Web of Science. And we also looked at what the Australian government requires uh, in terms of rankings of institutions based on the quality of their submissions. And that's called ERA. I then set you a task where you mind mapped out your nucleus, your uh, sort of communities of interest in terms of your thematic approaches to your study. You also looked at the key words that you would use in order to find these journals. And then you had a homework task, which was to bring this learning all together, which was to identify the top uh, 20 um, publications and the top 20 possible conferences you might go to. Uh, and those numbers are arbitrary if you found six um, in your search or if you found 10 and then you rank them either on H index as Ian did uh, a few days ago or you rank them on their era ranking whether they are considered an A or B or other journal or you rank them on Scopus based on impact factor, uh, eigen factor and a whole other list of prestige factors some of which we didn't go into but you know they exist and you can find them and their definitions on databases like Scopus. We also talked about the need to lift your thesis work so that it's commensurate to the kinds of outlets you are considering. So if, if you are going to submit a paper to our transactions, you need to make sure, welcome, you need to make sure 
that the paper that you submit to the transactions also has transactions level citations or references in the bibliography. Because what happens is that you are judged based on the quality of the submission but also the quality of your literature review and the quality um, of those outcomes in terms of whatever experiment or method you've implemented. Then we, in week three we talked about transactions, journals and magazines and we talked about the difference. Um, they're just three of about five or six different types of uh, publications that IEEE has in their list of 190 including letters, reviews, proceedings of the IEEE uh, and a few other smaller items like newsletters which are not peer reviewed. And transactions we talked about in the IEEE sphere are highly regarded usually of an impact factor of more than 2.5 and they require novel contributions to theory. Journals, we said, are not usually looking for novel contributions to theory but they are most likely more about novel contributions to application. Magazines, we said, are a completely different beast and we said that magazines are to communicate hot topics and issues with strong argumentation and your work may take um, the style of commentaries, your work may take the style of an opinion piece which is non-peer reviewed in the majority of cases. But your articles that are, are represented in magazines are also highly regarded, especially if you can ascertain that they've been peer reviewed and the submission uh, of manuscripts will tell you different magazines and their quality. I did provide an example uh, in the signal processing domain where some of the publications that we would not consider to have the highest impact factor came up as being the highest. The magazine, for example, in signal processing was somewhere at 7.8 impact factor but may not be ranked on ERA. So there's an anomaly there that we are constantly struggling with and that is we know what the ERA rankings tell us. They tell us where we should publish as an institution but what about when high impact factor outlets are not considered era worthy. What is going on there? And that's a long standing debate. Um, for your careers, perhaps what matters is a strong impact factor over a five year period. Uh, it's no good publishing, for example, in an outlet that may not be an era but has a one or two year um, impact factor that is very high. What happens over five years is that it's a more sober um, average but you'll find that many of them do stay up at that level. So if 7.8 is the signal processing magazine, most likely it'll be 7.8 or 7 or 8 in a couple of years' time. The, the IEEE outlets don't fluctuate um, as much, I would say, from my experience. But there was a case last week that we saw that the transactions in the journal in the signal processing domain was like half or a third of the impact factor of the magazine. So what I was trying to convey to you last week is that quality has nothing to do with your mode of communication. You can have a highly cited journal paper more than any other in what I would consider um, high level academic language. There could be a magazine article that might get more traction for you than an article which actually is representing the algorithm and novelty of the algorithm or the novelty of your application using an existing theory. So I would love to see you all experiment at this early age but to be logical in your reasoning. So by that I mean I think very importantly you have to think about if I have a literature review on my hands that I think is good what do I do with that literature review? Do I let it go out of date two years on? Or do I say I will attempt to repackage the literature review because nobody wants to publish a thesis literature review. Often one of the biggest mistakes of um, young people as they're learning about publication is that they'll take a chapter and submit it without any modification or very little modification. And what you need to do is to repackage that to have what I'm going to teach you today is a thesis. 
and I'm not talking about the thesis proper for those who walked in late. I'm not talking about the manuscript of 200 pages or 300. I'm talking about your underlying argument. What's your thesis? So I often, for a favor, review the work of students that are not my own. And they say, tell me, Katina, is this publish worthy? Is this publishable? Um, do you think the magazine might like it? And I, and I say, it's great work. But it's still not, there's no argument in there. It's like a bunch of facts that have been brought together and there's no critical observation or reflection in that lit review. You are not saying something, either that's a contribution or filling a gap of some sort, which literature reviews can do. Don't be shocked that some transactions actually may invite you to write literature reviews for them. <coughs> the proceedings of the IEEE actually call them review papers. PIEE has an impact factor of 9.8, almost 10. Very hard to get into. But don't dismiss the possibility that uh, you may be published with a literature review in these domains just because it carries the word transaction. But it's got to be a, a cracker of a review if they accept it. You know, you're looking at a probably 5% of those reviews accepted, which is a low potential, but um, if there's something novel there that you're doing in the lit review, excellent. Uh, we discussed bringing two different thematic areas together last week by your backgrounds or expertise. Uh, someone, for example, in mechanical engineering with someone in um, uh, rehab uh, or exercise um, science. So these are the kinds of things you can always be thinking about. But magazines are there to communicate to a wider audience, we said, and the narrower we go from journal to transactions or reviews, um, as in the IEEE review uh, for signal processing, um, we are becoming narrower in our specific audience. So for example, could I publish your work in a magazine that I'm an editor-in-chief of? Yes, if it was in scope. Could I publish your work um, in a specific transactions if that's your community of interest? Right? So here I'll give you an example. Uh, if, if you're in um, the geosciences or you're in engineering management or you're in um, engineering education, I really can't publish a signal processing paper in those outlets unless it's somehow directly linked to the engineering education or engineering management, right? That's why the journal recommender system for IEEE is paramount. The magazines are for a wider audience. I can invite people to talk about signal processing advancements in consumer electronics magazine or in IEEE security and privacy magazine or in technology and society um, magazine. But the more technical you're going to get, the more your work is shifting in language, in style, in empirical evidence, in simulation, in design towards the transactions. So all together we are one community. IEEE is one large community which everyone gets spectrum, right? That's a magazine, right? You see lots of different papers from lots of different people in IEEE spectrum. But if you were to ask me, if I'm a biomedical person, where should I be publishing? Spectrum is great because you've hit 440,000 people in one hit, right? And we talked about exposure last week and reputation and becoming the person who's the go-to person for that domain that you are studying. But when we let go of that wide audience and that big splash, which is why those impact factors of some of the magazines are rising quite quickly, we then look at the technical domain. And that's who you're really adding to in terms of your novel contributions to knowledge or your knowledge, uh, novel contributions to, to theory, practice, method, etc. Because your community starts to narrow. In your case, Tim, it's knowledge management. And if you were thinking about um, a fit with a transactions list of um, publications, you wouldn't be going to the signal processing guys, right? So that's what I mean. You, you, your technical community is identified. Um, I am holding three more lectures after this every Wednesday in this room, just if there's any confusion. But today we're going to focus on drafting your thesis and abstract. So the first exercise we're going to do is one on the board. And we're going to talk about the difference between a thesis and an abstract. 
escape. And a wandering experience. So now, so, so just to go over, okay, this term, I want to give you some reasoning to my thesis. And time is flying. This term, technological trajectory, is a term that was used, okay, in innovation literature. I didn't create it myself, okay? Anyone knowing innovation literature would go, I know what technological trajectory is. So I borrowed the term because that was what I was obsessed by in my thesis and I put it in the title. This was my domain, automatic identification. I studied barcodes, magnetic stripe cards, smart cards, biometrics and RFID tags and transponders. When I went to the long title, there's the active word, it's the application. In your case, Alexandra, it's improving. In your case, it's integrating Marion. In your case, it's the creation, um, Tim. And yours is the analogy, I think, Craig. Systems of innovation, it's not a theory, okay? But it was in the innovation literature and it was an established framework used by Scandinavians, which I really appreciated because, Tim, he talked about dimensions. Okay? So I almost think we're, we were working at a similar level, but I had a different method. Now, my methodology is somewhat implied because I said I applied this framework to this field. And what did I do? And here's the outcome. We haven't talked about the outcome yet. The outcome was that I characterised and predicted the auto ID I characterised and predicted where is the trajectory going. So we didn't really talk about the outcome being implicit in the title. And it may not be for all of you, you may not be able to do it. But if I can read a thesis title and I've got the domain, I've got the context, almost like you as a stakeholder. I've got, it's measurable. I know what sort of theory or method you're using. But if I can have almost a sneak preview of the outcome or what to expect, I've got everything. And your thesis title may not be like this one. I'm not telling you this is perfect. But I did spend a lot of time with my supervisor reviewing what is a title about. All right, and what does it tell me? Like, and so what, you know? But often the long title doesn't have room for the so what. In mine, I was able to sneak it in, and it wasn't my words. It was my brilliant supervisor, Dr. Robin Williams, who told me, so what are you doing? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and she said, you're characterizing and predicting. I said, what do you need to say? <laughs> and I wrote it down. Literally, that was how the discussion went in 1996, 97, before I started in 97. So I thank her for those words. Uh, and she helped me a great deal in, in focusing, right? You just, it, you have brilliant um, titles at the moment. You may tweak them, you may not. I think feel secure, especially if you're in second year or longer. What you've written, go home, type it up, paste it on your computer, or just below. I also found that putting things just below, right? Like the thesis title was important, especially at write-up stage. Now, we're going to skip in the last 15 or 13 minutes, and I've got time after this, I think uh, I have to go to a book launch for an, an academic today, but I think I have time if you want to talk further. But IEEE is starting to create resources for authors, and I'll, ex I'll explode you into the joy of all the online resources next week, but this week I wanted to talk about the Akira. And, and I also wanted to talk briefly about the importance of the thesis, the underlying argument to your article. If there is no underlying argument, you don't have an article. And it's again like this business of is it measurable, is there an outcome, what method is it, what domain is it. This is a bit like the underlying argument. In the more qualitative research, it would be a statement that you either prove or disprove as a general theorem. This is the way the Cambridge scholars, Oxford scholars are taught. Um, I'm doing a, a certificate with Cambridge University at the moment, and I found this the hardest thing I was wrestling when I first started the program to figure out what is this darn thing called the thesis, and here I am as an editor-in-chief. Humbly, I tell you this because you are always learning 
constantly. And the better my thesis got, the better my underlying argument got, the better the paper score was. That's what I found naturally happened. And I'm, I'm figuring the same will happen in the domain of our writing, and I'm getting better at it out of, after 20 years of practice, is the abstract. So let's just switch to the thesis and look what it says. Okay, every paper you write should have a main point. Okay. A main idea or a central message. Every paper you write, you've got to have a reason, right? You're just not writing a, I summarise ten pages. It has to, you have to have a reason. The arguments you make in your paper should reflect the main idea. The sentence that captures your position on this main idea is what we call a thesis statement. Well, you almost wrote a thesis statement for your whole thesis a second ago. You articulated it, right? So I won't go on about it. But as Craig said, but I've given you this out of my whole thing, right? Which is the beginning of your first article, if you haven't done 10 already, okay? So you've just given me a top article, right, for something. And you haven't talked with, with each other, I'm happy to spend coffee with you and then to show you what everyone else learned about how to scope where you start to publish, um, as well as the recommendation of your supervisor. How long does it need to be? And someone said a phrase before, right? You were almost there. Someone said a couple of sentences. A thesis statement focuses your ideas into one or two sentences. That's your long title, right? And a bit more, perhaps. You should present the topic of your paper and also make a comment about your position. One of my highly cited papers pros and cons of RFID. You know, what was your position? The benefits and the costs, you know? Um, um, the other one was, that's highly cited, is uh, big data, opportunities and challenges. What's it about? It's about big data and it's about opportunities and challenges. Right? And for you, Tim, it could be knowledge management managerial metrics or knowledge management you know, it's bang. It's just like bang. So your first big article is, is like bang. Um, your thesis statement should tell you, the reader, what the paper is about and it should help you guide your writing and keep your arguments focused. That's probably the hardest thing is to keep an argument focused throughout several pages, especially when you've got um, simulation data, real person data, um, in your case, um, designing an algorithm or, or, or executing an algorithm to show what the results are for, for this huge amount of information that you've got in this point in the paper quickly. You should provide a thesis early in your essay, in the introduction, or in longer essays in the second paragraph, because in the beginning you might define. You might define, and then go and say in the second paragraph, now what's your thesis, right? is now the thesis. I would say to you, this is the hardest thing, is write the thesis. One of the things I was confronted with at Cambridge, and still am, is that we have a list of 10, 15 questions for our essays, and then it's all choose your own. Now, I always want to choose my own, but it's darn hard to get it right. And even the thing that they've got there, they've got a question, they say that's not the thesis. It does my, my mind in even more. So you've got questions, and you know, like we do essays here, or everywhere, to answer in the essay. And I said, no, 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 but that's not your thesis. That's the, sort of the, the question that we're asking generally, well, what's your thesis? You've got to take a position or a side. And I'm going to try and find my early notes for my professor, because there you have one-on-one -on -one tutors each week. And I'll try and find, he's got a little one-pager, I'll ask permission if I can give it to you, on developing the thesis. So it's not just like what a knowledge management system that, that could be the, the question, right? Let's, let's just use a basic example. What a knowledge management system. They're saying to me, that's the question, but now you write the thesis. And I might write a thesis that says, managers have to be more aware of interpersonal and functional skills, KPIs related to knowledge management. You know, the awareness could be the, the actual thesis. But it's not what a knowledge management system. So, so for your thesis 
so it's just a big one. And then because that's just too much to pass, I want to write a nice one. It's got to be streamlined. That's the way. Remember the thread I was talking about, anticipation as you're going through. Okay? So avoid burying the great piece of sentence in the middle of a paragraph. To be as clear and specific as possible, avoid vague words. Indicate the point of your paper, but avoid sentence structures. The point of my paper is. Yeah. We'll communicate via email. Tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, 12 o'clock. Can I just, just quickly so I can get it? Maybe 15 seconds. Let me double check what I need to tomorrow in my diaries. Eleven o'clock tomorrow. Thank goodness for that. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. At Gypsy Jones. Okay. Yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Yeah. See ya. So then, that's the thesis statement, and then we've got to. Okay. There's more information there about constructing the thesis statement and writing an abstract, which I want to go back to quickly before five minutes is up. So IEEE have a lot of resources now to help um, writers and authors. I had a document from the Panel of Editors Conference that I'm allowed to share with you. It's called Boilerplate Articles. Like, how do you, What's the guts of an article for IEEE? Um, if you're an IEEE member, you have um, links to Collaborative. That's an online community that if you are in your domain, say it's uh, BCI, say it's uh, exercise science or it's um, mechanical engineering, you will go to that special section and you'll find other authors that you can ask questions. Same with you, Ian, there's a lot of computer vision guys. That's like the Quora or the Reddit um, of IEEE. Right? So if you want to ask a question, that, and they constantly ask questions, you'd be interested. If you've got your ear to that group, you're going to get opportunities that no one here will get because no one finds out outside <laughs> that group. You've got to be online to get it. Collaborative. So if you, want to, if you have an idea, you can always ask your community, what do you think about my article idea? They're not going to go and pitch it. They can't. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are doing experimental work. It's not that they can't pitch the idea. But if you want to ask some, you know, follow what's going on, just have a look at the collaborative environment, and then you sign in to IEEE. But if, if you want to ask, and after you feel comfortable, you know, hi, say who you are. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, like, happy to be. And you get people responding to you. See how you're building your network internationally. And hearing about calls for papers. So Alexandra and Marianne, you are right. 250 words for the abstract. Be self-contained without abbreviations. Highlight what is novel. Just words. That's it. Include three to five key words or phrases that describe the research at the end of the abstract. If the submission requires that. When someone says summary, your abstract should provide a concise summary of the research conducted. Okay? The conclusions reached, the potential implications of the conclusions. So, why did we go through this exercise? Right? Because I could have been showing you the boilerplate material, more information on how to construct your article, but if you get the abstract wrong, or you get the thesis title or the title of the article wrong. You bomb your paper instantly. The relationship, just quickly, the thesis should look something like this. Not everyone's type of thesis is this, but just like you said, Alexandra, and I put the words up on the screen, introduction, method, result, discussion, conclusion. But the thesis, depending on what type of thesis you're doing, you know, biomedical, it's, it's a classic kind of biomedical or electrical engineering. For you, Tim, it might be different. For you, it might be Ian, just like this. Right? But I, I want you to think about it. And then the next level down, down that's like your, your, your type of thesis you're doing. Okay? More qualitative thesis don't look this straightforward. But for an experiment, you go introduction, usually the group is this. Hands up if you're a literature. Yep, good. A literature review is where you review other people's work and other people's methods, look at similarities and differences, and then have a conclusion. The methods chapter is talking about the survey thing, the interviews that you're doing, the focus group, the simulation, the experiment, right? The design science element. 
and you've got to look at method books to understand the language. You know, is yours a quanti qualitative uh, method? Is it a quantitative? Is it triangulation? Is it a simulation? How are you collecting data? How are you analyzing the data? This has got to do with the approach you're taking, but also how your data collection is happening and how your data analysis is happening. So have a talk about those two components. Doesn't matter what kind of thesis you're doing. Data collection, data analysis. You have you have multi method kind of view as well. In your case, Miriam, you might talk about the integration in this chapter as well. Yes. And then writing another chapter for talking about um, a second standard in the system. You will need this then. For another chapter, separate chapter, you say? Yes. Most likely. Mm -hmm. If you do overarching research design thesis, but you are a supervisor, you don't need that specifically. It's just I haven't seen a thesis without a method in my life. I have seen it without literary, literary views, and I don't like those theses but then I come from a different domain. I have never seen an overarching research design. So you're, I know what you're saying, that your experiment and the results will be in one chapter, and then you've got another experiment and the results in another chapter, and then your discussion, you might do a cross-chain comparison, or you might do the integration of where the discussion and reflection of what we've learned in those two previous chapters. But Please borrow books from the library on research design and look at your domain of study. Look at another one, a good one is Australian Digital Thesis, and we also have a Digital Thesis Act to teach you the pros, uh, I think it's MLA. You can actually type up, this is something that I've got to put in the notes because I don't want you to forget, Australian Digital Thesis, ADT, and now it might be somewhere else, but you can look up Wollongong, all the people that finish from Wollongong. structure of their thesis um, and you can search on keywords again it's a repository yeah there we go that's the trove uh, and this is um, a group of li library librarians um, our our managing libra library um, manager here at UOW is the head of this call group, um, Finding Australian Theses and Help on Finding Australian Theses. So you can actually look, how can I browse recently produced theses? Okay, I'll, I'll do some homework for you. It used to be a lot simpler. There used to be a website called the ADT that we went to our library website. But by looking at that, you just put in the knowledge management system, the metrics, by the way, we work in Spare Team. Um, but put, put in the rest just to see what it, what's that method look like. And finally, when we've got an outline, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the title of our thesis argument, the title of a thesis. I want you to start looking at the contents of your thesis. And this provides you tips with chapter titles. See here. The existence of an introduction chapter. Notice how the titles of the major sections of the chapter relate clearly to the chapter title. And I don't want you to go more than three levels. Whenever I say three level headings, chapter one, chapter three is your first level. 3.1 is your second level. 3.22 is your third. One, two, three, one, two, one. Right? In a thesis, if you go four levels, you're getting too messy, you've lost the order. You might have to once or twice in your thesis, but if you're going too metric, you're getting too convoluted. So thinner the contents 
on level one, level two, level three, the, the better you have a chance of going through with something seamless. If you need a fourth level heading, 3.311, you can uh, just say to yourself, think twice before you do it. You might need it two or three times in the whole thesis. You're allowed. There's no problem. But when you see nested, by nested I mean, you've got level two heading, level three, level four, level five, right? It's crazy. The other thing I'm going to suggest, be very simple on your template. I don't know what the university suggests. Bold, right? You've got an invitation happening here, okay? And perhaps um, an italic or just plain text. And I would almost say plain text as a, as a third level title. It's got to do with the spacing, right? Often people don't tell you these things. These are fundamental to you just getting that thing finished and submitting. You'll remember these words, I hope I see you again next year, but as we're getting closer to the end, but um, that's really important. Three level headings, not four, if you can get away with it, and keep your template really simple. Latex helps you if you're using latex. Are you using latex, Mary? No, yeah, I don't like latex either, but some people would swear by it. My friend did one, so. Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's good. Really yeah, so and it looks. Very pretty, yeah. right? Um, typical um, computer science kind of output from there, but it's very legible, the font's beautiful, etc., etc., and you never have words stuffing up on you when you're trying to update things. So that's what I hear anyway. Um, but I'll stick by Word or Google Docs. Um, I don't suggest you finish your thesis in Google Docs, but definitely get it to the point just before pagination, and Google Docs is fine. Um, but back up your work, that's the other thing, you know. So I think we'll leave it there. I hope this has been helpful, I hope, just to hone in and keep scoping. And, and that thesis title is critical because that's what hangs up everything. I don't know if there are any questions.